Hi, my name is David Hicks. Welcome to this series on getting to know Jesus. Today we're going to focus on Jesus' teachings, especially on love. Before we get into all that, just a quick overview of some of the things, the most important things we've covered. And I'll use John 3.16 to do that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his only one-of-a-kind son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There is a judgment day coming. There's going to be a day when God looks at this earth, this messed up earth, and like a drawing that's gone bad, he's going to wad it up, throw it away, and make something totally new. And what this and what he's going to make that is totally new, he has told us the, that the death, the sorrow, the crying, the pain, all that's going away. And he is going to live among us, and we are going to be his children. Everlasting life with God himself. But if we reject God, if we refuse God, there is that possibility that we could perish. And what we looked at and what we saw is the Bible calls that perishing the second death, where come judgment day, if we're not found, if we're not acquitted, found innocent, however you want to say it, those people will be put into the lake of fire, the place that we no, no, normally refer to as hell. And that is no place that any sane person would ever, ever, ever want to go. So what's the plan to save us? Well, the plan was that to send Jesus. Jesus went from being God to being God's obedient son. And so now, as in the teachings we're reading today, Jesus is in the heart and soul of his ministerial years. The years he spent teaching, preaching, uh, training, going around, do, doing miracles, demonstrating that he was God's son. And so today we're going to focus on his teachings regarding love. Later in another series, we'll see how ultimately Jesus took the punishment that our sins deserve, and he could do that because he never sinned. And because he did that, then God is offering us salvation. He's offering us forgiveness for all the evils that we have done. And then when we accept that, then we don't have to worry about perishing. We will receive that everlasting life. So that's kind of the big picture of things. Now, God so loved the world, okay? Love is central, a central part of who God is and who Jesus is. And so it's not surprising then that Jesus talks a, a, a lot about love, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly, in his teachings. Now let me slide aside, if you will, and show you, if you want to go ahead and start doing a deep dive into Jesus' teachings, because this is a series I'm not going to hit all of Jesus' teachings. I haven't come close to it. But Matthew chapter 5 through 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. Maybe you've heard of it. But Jesus has lots of different teachings. It's all there in three, three chapters, just back to back to back. So it's a fantastic place if you really want to uh, start studying Jesus' teachings on your own to, to read. Matthew 7, 12 is the golden rule. We're going to see Luke's version of that today, that whole idea of treating others the way you want to be treated. And we're going to start with Luke chapter 6, verse 20 through 49. Uh, we're not going to read all these verses for time's sake, but this is kind of, this hits, a, it, it's kind of a summary, if you will, of Matthew chapter 5 through 7. It doesn't hit all the teachings that are in Matthew 5 through 7, but it hits a lot of the most important ones. And we'll start there. We'll look today at the parable of the Good Samaritan. And then finally, we'll end with some uh, Jesus' teachings, uh, some more of Jesus' teachings on love. So Luke chapter 6, I'm going to start with verse 27. And no, unfortunately, I don't have these marked. You know, that's, that's, yeah. Luke chapter 6, beginning at verse 27. Jesus is speaking. But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. 
pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes away your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Love your enemies. We know God wants us to love people, but there are certain people that it is very difficult to love. They are doing things that are bringing pain and suffering and persecution into our lives. God wants me to love them? Yes, he does. And we'll get more into that in, in a minute here. But Jesus, one of the things I want to focus on, and, and I want to use this verse to illustrate it, is that everything Jesus is asking us to do, he himself is willing to do. God is not, uh, I think it's just in one of our last videos, that God doesn't come to us and say, hey, I want you to love me more than I love you. I want you to do these things even though I myself, nah, I wouldn't do them. No, everything that Jesus taught us, he himself was willing to do and he himself did. For example, this turning the other cheek. We tend to find excuses for not doing this, but think about Jesus' death. Maybe you don't know the story, so let me give you, before Jesus was crucified on the cross, he, he was tortured. And one of the things that happened to him over and over in his torturing was that he was beaten. Several times the soldiers got together and they slapped him. Slapped him and hit him. And what did Jesus do? Did he save himself? Did he have the power to save himself? Of course. But did he choose to use it? No. He turned the other cheek. And instead of getting his revenge or defending himself, he just took it. He did exactly what he was teaching us to do here. And that is the way it is with all of Jesus' teachings. He never teaches us and asks us to do something that he himself isn't willing to do. And his coming to earth and living life in this crazy world helps prove that. All right, so he says, do to others as you would have them do to you. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Let's keep going. If, the, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. Because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. You see, if we just love people who love us, we are no different than anybody else. Even people who can't stand God, who hate God, who don't believe God exists at all, they love people who love them. They do good to people who do good to them. Some of the worst people in the world are like that. Okay? But God calls us to a higher love. A love that loves people that don't necessarily love us back. Think about if you're a spouse, think about your marriage. There are times in your marriage where for whatever reason, your spouse is going through a dark time and they just aren't able to reciprocate, reciprocate the love that you show them. Does that mean you stop loving them? No. Love them without worrying about whether they're able to love you back. It's the best marriage advice um, I can give you. But here, Jesus talks about God and how God loves this way. He says, because he, that is God, is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. 
Now, if you read the Sermon on the Mount that we referenced earlier, Jesus uses a couple of examples of this. He talks about how God makes his sun rise for the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. You see, God loves us unconditionally. And what I mean by that is that God's love is unearnable. God's love is independent of whether or not we are pleasing him at the time. If you're a parent and you have children whom you love, sorry about that, it looks like the video just bogged down for a second there. If you're a parent and you have children whom you love, you know that sometimes they do things that don't please you. May even hack you off and drive you nuts. But that doesn't mean you've stopped loving them. Your love for them is independent of, hopefully, this is the way it should be, whether or not they are doing things that please you at the time. It doesn't mean you don't want them to change their behavior. It doesn't mean that you don't want them to stop doing those things that you know are wrong. Okay? Your love is unconditional. But there are things and behaviors that you're going to want them to change. God is the same way. He loves us whether or not we're following him or not. He wants us to be saved whether we're following him or not. He shows kindness to us whether we're following him or not. But that doesn't mean that what we are doing is necessarily pleasing to him. And it doesn't mean that God doesn't want us to change certain things in our life that are not uh, that are evil and wrong. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, let's look at this parable of the Good Samaritan. It sets, uh, it's, you know, one of the world's most famous phrases is uh, for coming from the Bible is about the Good Samaritan. You often hear it in reference to somebody who helps somebody else on the side of the road. Well, this is a story from, uh, this is the story that illustrates that. Luke chapter 10, let me slide again, uh, starting at verse 25. Now, while you're looking it up, let me give you a little bit of the background of what we're going to see. It's going to talk, This story is going to have an expert in the law, meaning the law of Moses, the scriptures, the holy writings from God that were there at the time that Jesus lived. It's going to talk about a priest Part of one role that God formed, if you will, in the Israelites was that certain people were priests. And those were the ones who kind of stood in the gap between the rest of the people and God, who brought the animal, the sacrifices to God, the, the, the blood of the sacrifices, in asking for atonement, in asking for forgiveness and mercy uh, for the priests themselves and for the people. So they were kind of a go-between, between the Israelites, the Jews, and God himself, those whom God designated to be priests. There's also a mention of the Levites. If you watch that series that we did about things that happened between creation and when Jesus came, we saw Abraham, a man who pleased God because of his great faith. He had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons, and each of those sons, their excuse me, their descendants became a tribe in Israel. One of the sons' names was Levi, and so his descendants were Levites. The Levites were chosen by God to be responsible for anything and everything related to the worship of God, taking care of the articles used in worship, the gold lampstands and altars and, and um, even the Ark of the Covenant, the, the Holy throne, the holy seat of God that God had the Israelites make, the tent, the tabernacle that God had the Israelites make in the wilderness, they took care of that. So anything and everything related to the worship of God was their responsibility. What Their role also was to teach God's ways to the people. Now, with that in mind, oh, the last thing is Samaritan. What's a Samaritan? Samaritans lived if I could draw Israel for you, there was the northern section of Gal uh, Galilee, the southern section of Judea, but in between was where the Samaritans lived. Samaritans were Jewish, but not Jews. They were, 
uh, descendants of those who had been moved into that area when the Israelites were taken into captivity. So just the bottom line is this. Jews hated Samaritans. That was their, that was their racism, their major racism issue at the time. They hated Samaritans. Samaritan, Samaritans hated them as well, generally speaking. And so with that backdrop, let's read this parable. Let's read this story. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So this expert in the law comes to Jesus and says, what, uh, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Now notice, Jesus didn't rebuke him and say there's no such thing as eternal life. No, he, he asked, he just turned around and said, well, what's written in the law? What do you think? You're an expert in the law, what do you think? And so the man nails the answer. He it's the perfect answer. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if you read Matthew 22, verse 35 through 40, Jesus himself talks about these two commands, and he calls them the greatest commands. The greatest, first and foremost, is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, strength, however you want to say it. And then the second greatest command is to love our neighbor as ourself. So it's the perfect answer. And Jesus says, you answered correctly, do this and you will live. In other words, do this and you'll have eternal life. But the guy wanted to justify himself. Now, what did that mean? I have some theories. I'll give you the one that's most likely. Most likely, he's trying to justify whom he believes is his neighbor and whom he believes is not his neighbor. Because if he's got it right, he knows, okay, these people... I, I need to love these people. I don't have to love them. That's my best guess as to what he's is saying. It's saying by he wanted to justify himself. So that's when Jesus launches into the parable of the Good Samaritan. The parable is a, a any sort of um, earthly story with a spiritual meaning behind it. It's not a very long story normally, but it just it's some sort of event in life, some common event in life. And the way Jesus tells the story, there's spiritual meaning behind it. So we have this guy, he's traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he gets robbed, beaten, stripped of his clothes, left half dead, which kind of reminds me of that, what's the movie, um, always escapes me at the time, where the guy's mostly dead, and then, well, if you're mostly dead, you're partially alive. Okay, if he's half dead, he's half alive. So he's not dead yet. Fortunately, so a priest comes by, and you would think a priest would help him. Instead, the guy passes by on the other side. The Levite comes by. Remember, their job is to take care of all things related to, to worship and to teach people God's ways. He passes by on the other side. Now, why? We don't know. We don't know what their excuses were. Oh, my goodness. I, I, that guy's so gross, I can't touch him. I don't have time to help him. I don't have... You know, I, I, I'm busy. I've got a, this important that I got to get to, you know. 
who knows? Who knows what their excuses were? Jesus doesn't spell them out for us. doesn't really matter because the bottom line is they didn't help him. And so finally the Samaritan comes, the one who the one who Jews look down upon and abhor normally, the Samaritan comes and he helps the person. Clothes him, bandit, he takes care of his wounds, puts him on his own animal, which forces him to walk, uh, puts him on his own animal and forces him to walk. Um, and so he, you know, leads this man to a hotel, uh, to an inn, um, takes care of the guy, pays for his room and board, his food, and says, hey, look, I'm, when I come back this way, if I owe you more money, I'll pay you back. So completely takes care of the guy's tap. That's showing mercy, and that's what Jesus challenged us to do. It's not that there's some people in our life that, hey, that's my neighbor, I'll love them. No, no, that's not my neighbor. I'm not, I don't have to love them. Jesus just wants us to go and show mercy to the people around us. All of mankind is our neighbor, and we need to love all of mankind. So quickly, uh, I'll give you a summary of the verses in John, or I'll just try to read them very quickly. John 13, 34, and 35. And we'll, I'll tell you what, for time's sake, we'll not read John 15, 9 through 14. It's, it's basically a combination of these two just in more detail. It's great to read. I encourage you to read it. But for time's sake, I'm just going to read John 13, 34 through 35 and uh, John 14, 15. Here Jesus is talking to his apostles and his death is imminent. So he's given kind of his final instructions when he says, A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. All men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Okay, so Jesus gives us a new command. Love one another. Wait a minute, I thought we already had that command. Love your neighbors yourself. Yeah, but he's going, he's improving this command. One, instead of saying, love your neighbor, and us all getting caught up, well, who's my neighbor? That, that question that Jesus just dealt with, throw that out. It's simply love one another. The second change is that the standard has improved. You see, the Old Testament standard was love your neighbor as yourself. That's a good standard, but a lot of us have difficulty loving ourselves. And so if we're challenged in knowing how to love ourselves, we're going to be challenged in loving the people around us. The standard's good, but it's not perfect. So now that standard has been replaced by something that is perfect. The way Jesus loved us. Love one another as I have loved you. That's the perfect standard. John 14, 15 says, uh, Jesus says, if you love me, you will do what I command. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Do we want to show love to Jesus? Do what he says. Okay, that's how we demonstrate our love for Jesus by learning his <laughs> teachings and incorporating them into our life, changing our life to conform to God's values, God's desires, God's teachings. And we'll look more on those teachings of Jesus in our next video. I will say this, in John 15, Jesus talks about, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. You want to be a friend to Jesus? Do what he commands. And he also says, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. Who laid down his life for us? It was Jesus. He allowed himself to be tortured and crucified to pay the price, to take the punishment for our sins. He showed us the greatest love he could possibly show us. And so that's why I am hoping that you'll come to love Jesus and follow him. May God bless you. May God bless this recording. Have a great evening, night, whenever you're uh, watching this. 
Thank you for watching. Feel free to subscribe. God bless.